Dear Rava, and anyone else who might be out there uh, listening to me, uh, if I look very cold, uh, I am. We're having a cold snap here in the northeast of America, and I am out on my porch uh, so that I don't wake my wife at an ungodly morning hour. And I have in front of me my happy birds uh, for whom I have laid out seeds and mealworms, toasted and fried, um, and peanut butter. And they're happy. Uh, I'm not uh, <laughs> quite as warm and active as they are. So I thought I should continue a little picking up some of the strands uh, from what I was discussing uh, last time in, uh, in video number eight, uh, trying to evoke uh, what, was, what was meant for me by my own insight about um, the defining uh, monologues uh, that I found uh, all over the place uh, in, uh, in dramatic writing. And, and what that meant. Um, and so I want to refer back to that uh, story spine theme, uh, News My Lord from Troy, um, and uh, the moment when theatre renounces its dialogic self that has uh, defined it uh, as something else other than uh, direct storytelling around uh, the hearth, around the fire. Um, and, uh, and yet returns to its, uh, to its roots and its origins in ways that promise a deeper dive into the material than the arguing out of different views of that material. And the point here, I think, uh, since uh, um, uh, it's easy enough to question uh, both uh, modern and ancient drama on this issue is that uh, in the history of theatre, history itself stands still and repeats its fundamental issues um, in very much the way that time does in drama itself. And that's something I want to come back to uh, for a moment. Once uh, I've turned to a place, to space, uh, as a companion here uh, to time. Um, I was always very struck as a theater goer in my younger days by the difference between um, the curtain going up or the lights going up on a relatively empty space which promised to coalesce in its meaning uh, around uh, people just as um, uh, scenes in Shakespeare are often des described as people scenes rather than place scenes. But by contrast with that, which seems to me intrinsically theatrical and to reach certainly right back into the theater of Dionysus, you could also enter a theater and even before the curtain went up sometimes you would see an enormous stage very fully decked out uh, with stuff. Uh, clearly far too much of it to truck on and off. You were there in this room uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf uh, uh, provides a perfect example, in this immensely cluttered room. And your response, if you're me, is, oh, how will this be lifted? How will this be rendered theatrical? This bric-a-brac, uh, this vast uh, uh, mess of detail that we're presented with. And yet the miracle was that by the time you'd been uh, attending to the play for a couple of hours, the room and all its clutter had acquired uh, a metaphorical status. You no longer saw it as a cluttered room. It was simply the place, the space. Uh, it had been metaphorized by uh, the action of drama itself and become exactly the same as an empty stage. That's to say, uh, even if people would reach into a bookshelf on this cluttered stage and pick up a book and throw it at somebody, uh, it would, it's, it's no more real uh, once you've been watching a play uh, for a, an hour or two, no more real than if they reached uh, into an imaginary bookcase and mimed the throwing of it. Uh, you would duck along with the actor uh, because the imaginary book uh, would then be just as real uh, as the real book on the cluttered stage. And uh, this intrigued me tremendously. Uh, why was hypernaturalism of the kind 
uh, I remember a, a production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on Broadway that featured just such a set. Um, how did it not weigh heavily on the shoulders of the actors? Well, it weighed nothing. Uh, soon, soon enough, it weighed absolutely nothing. It was dematerialized. You, you might say it was metaphorized to become the thing that all stage spaces are, metaphors. Um, smart of uh, um, the ancient Greeks to put a house front at the back um, and with a door that opened, that's all you needed at the bottom, the actors could enter from the sides of the stage uh, and also uh, through the doors uh, at, the, at, at, at the bottom uh, in the center of uh, the house front uh, that represented an exterior. Uh, and uh, similarly in Shakespeare, they, they added a balcony. It was very good to have that, as well as the curtains down below, which could part to reveal a space that was inside, but could come out to be outside. And this all-purpose space, the pillars uh, in uh, the Shakespearean theater, the pillars on the fourth stage, uh, which afforded a little sitting place down at the bottom of it where uh, w a person could be sitting on one side of the pillar and be unaware uh, of a person on the other side of the pillar. Puck could sit on one side and one of the lovers could sit on the other quite unaware of each other, describing for us the invisibility of, uh, of figures uh, who make decisive moves uh, in our life. So. Uh, no change then uh, in uh, the nature of the space, uh, regardless of the great artfulness of stage designers, which began uh, in uh, 1660 with uh, restoration drama and the most gorgeous uh, um, representations, portrayals of, evocations of, buildings of, buildings, regardless, none of them real. All of them evaporated into the space, uh, in which is where all plays take place. Now, m more interestingly, perhaps, uh, is that the same thing happens with time on stage. Um, the classical French theater uh, picked out rules which many people imagine must have been uh, there in Aristotle's time but weren't about how time was to be distributed uh, on stage, uh, how uh, the, the uh, uh, action was to take place in real time, as we now says, a, a more inappropriate phrase could not exist. Uh, because in fact, uh, in those great plays of uh, Racine's and Corneille's, there is no time. Uh, a play like Berenice, great masterpiece uh, by Racine, takes place, yes, in real time, yes, in two hours, but no, in no time at all as the crux of the issue between three people, the trembling crux is discussed, is argued, uh, is rehearsed over and over, waiting outside the theater are horses and chariots, horses stamping, panting, longing to go, uh, a fleet in the port, uh, waiting, uh, longing to be allowed to take the wind and go, but none of them can move not the horses and not the ships. They are paralyzed waiting for the people to sort out the crux. And that happens in no time, <laughs> no time at all, uh, as long as it takes, is how long uh, a play lasts under the uh, uh, classical uh, unities, uh, so-called. Um, and uh, uh, the same is true in Corneille, if you imagine, in Le Cid, where the crux is that the great hero is about to marry his beloved uh, Chimène, uh, has the misfortune on the day of his wedding, on the morning of his wedding, to uh, be obliged to fight a duel with her father and kill him. So there now we have a crux. We have a stinking parcel of pollution in the center of the stage, much as uh, displays itself to Oedipus when he comes out uh, uh, to uh, Apollo's shrine there and says to his people, yes, I know there's a stink. And we're going to sort it out because clearly somebody's responsible and has brought pollution into uh, the city. And who could that be? We'll find him and nail him to that cross. So the crux uh, of, uh, of Oedipus is uh, 
what will happen when, as we all know, we, the audience, who are familiar with Oedipus's story, as we all know, when will he realize that he is the detective uh, trying to solve a case in which he is, happens also uh, to be the murderer? Um, where, how, how long will it take him uh, to realize what this stink is and realize that he cannot <coughs> sort it out any longer? Any more than, than, than the poor seed can. Once he's killed Shimane's dad, his, his erstwhile future father-in-law, <laughs> He can't return <coughs> him to, uh, um, to life and try and find an alternative resolution. The stink has got to be uh, carried off stage. In the end, it's where Oedipus takes it. He goes onto the road with the stink. And I think uh, this is what happens always to time um, in, uh, in theater, regardless of clock time or what we think of as real time. Time stands still until uh, the parcel uh, gets opened, the knot, uh, the lump, the knot that is Orestes, the knot that is Antigone, that is Phaedra, that is Othello, that is Uncle Vanya. Can he, can Vanya find an escape? No. That is Godo. Will he come? No. The knot then must be disentangled, if possible, or severed, as a knot is severed, or sent back with polluted keep away <laughs> written on it uh, or sent out in other words to wander the roads like Oedipus beyond sight and therefore beyond time like Vanya there is only futile life left he's uh, at the end as he scribbles in the ledger of the farm uh, that he's failed to attend to during the summer and autumn of the distracting presence of Yelena and her husband. He is Oedipus at that moment. He is setting out on that blind, futile journey because he has not been able to lay down his journey, his burden, and open um, the parcel of uh, pollution. So what we have is that uh, closure belongs once and once only to Athena in the Oresteia. And uh, there at the founding, uh, where it has a right to be, where it's obliged to be, if we did not have that to guide us, we might think that, uh, um, that theatre told the, uh, a story of most hopeless negativity, uh, the story in some ways that, <laughs> that Euripides uh, uh, tells. But in fact, it's, it's Aeschylus's uh, uh, right to open the theatre uh, and to give, uh, show uh, what's happening in there and to give us a key to the theater and say, okay, now, now uh, you have to uh, sort things out. Um, so uh, for Oedipus, it's too late, too late. Antigone and Creon, they act by their own lights. Everyone who matters dies, except Creon and Tiresias, who is the guardian of time. Poor bamboozled Othello dies in vain. Iago refuses to speak. Vladimir and Estragon bear witness to Vanya's futile repetition and cannot know its meaning or its destination, nor will Godot speak any more than Iago. We are still trapped in that circle of hell between belief uh, as represented to us by Aeschylus and unbelief as uh, Euripides represented in the place where we are, where Sophocles walks the line. Is God there or not? Shakespeare walks exactly the same line, and no matter how thorny his language is, for many of us we cannot pull out the thorn and be rid of him until we decide, is there a God or not? Sophocles, Shakespeare, and Chekhov, the great pilgrims to the shrine of Apollo Dramatist, bring back the same answer. Maybe, and maybe not. If only we knew, implore Chekhov's benighted women. If only we knew. But uh, the essence of drama is that we cannot know until Athena returns and supplies us with a court of law in which the terrible issues uh, between people can be ritually resolved. Until then, 
and drama continues, the same Sophoclean drama as it always was, uh, occurring in no time, in no place, towards the same uh, maddening end as we set out on the road carrying our own pollution. Uh, enough for the moment, uh, dear ones. Bye.